Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, speaking with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. John, good to see you again. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, you wrote a fascinating article in the uh, Virtual Gourmet recently uh, ba based on the uh, TV show, The Swans, and uh, which was a, a, a kind of a documentary, if you will, a, a drama dramatized documentary about real women yes. who were the highest of society in New York in what, the 50s or 60s? Well, starting in the uh, 50s, uh, yeah. and definitely into the 60s when the famous short story that Truman Capote wrote. Uh, yeah, so I, I love the article because it was a mix of um, restaurant where they would hold forth and a mix of their weird personalities. I guess the show, it's a big hit. I haven't seen it yet. Enormous hit, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, it is, it is is based on back in 1975, Truman Capote, who was at the height of his fame and powers, having written <clears throat> In Cold Blood, which is a masterpiece of American literature. He wrote a story, 10,000 word story for Esquire magazine called La Côte Basque 1965. Um, so 10 years earlier <clears throat> than we was actually writing it. And it was about, it was just called La Côte Basque 1965. It was about this famous restaurant that lasted well until, I don't know, 2000, something like that. A French restaurant, <coughs> which was inundated, well, as much as it could be inundated with a sh small number, of society people, very powerful people, heads of networks, millionaires, mere millionaires in those days, and these society ladies, all of whom were very beautiful, Babe Paley, Slim Whitman, CZ Guest, um, Jackie Kennedy, uh, Onassis by, by that time in the 60s. Um, these were the kind of women, the slim, which Tom Wolfe later called the, uh, the social x-rays, who dominated the gossip columns much more so in those days uh, than celebrities do now. You know, Taylor Swift is on every single page of the gossip pages and uh, Lindsay Lohan or whatever. And back then it was these, these were the women who bought the haute couture. These are the women who could have champagne for a lunch. They always dressed beautifully. They always just came from their hairdressers. And they were friends who didn't like each other very much because in many respects they were, um, they were, uh, her, their husbands were cheating on them all over the place. They were cheating on their husbands. There was a lot of alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this short story that Truman Capote wrote didn't name them by name. He used them as types, but they could all see themselves in it. And they turned on him. They were very, very, very good friends. He used to dine at Look on Bus like every day. And they turned on him and um, he scrambled for the rest of his life, which became increasingly alcoholic and drug addicted till the day he died, um, to get back in their good graces. And that would be kind of a passing story in and of itself. All of those women are now dead. Babe Paley died before Truman Capote did of cancer. She was a big cigarette smoker. Um, another one committed suicide and so forth. But nobody knows those names anymore. And society of that kind died out. But there was a time, and we're talking about the 1950s after the war, in the 1950s and 60s and well into the 70s, when society dames, the ladies who lunch, were in fact very important to deciding what the cachet of, uh, of New York was. And in the show, uh, the feud, uh, the Swans versus Truman Capote, uh, which just stopped playing. You can watch it right now. It was say, eight or nine episodes. Very, very well done, by the way. It's beautifully acted by terrific actresses and, and Tom Holland playing uh, Truman Capote. But they were the ones who established the culture. And Slim Keith, uh, who had the most backbone of any of them, she was a California gal, um, said at one point, don't you understand? These people don't come here to eat. They come here to see us. We put New York on the map. 
It's a bit exaggerated, but not entirely, because the gossip columns, as I said, was filled every day with who went to Le Côte Basque, who went to Le Pavillon, who showed up with somebody else's uh, wife at, uh, at uh, um, Lutece, et cetera, et cetera. This was the gossipy stuff at the time. And as Oscar Wilde said, the only worse thing than being talked about is not being talked about. So they were quite happy with that, but they were not happy with Truman. Well, people asked, well, was it any good? Was Lacote Basque any good? So that's what the article is about as much. And what happened to celebrity restaurants? Lacote Basque was an offshoot of Le Pavillon, which set the style for French restaurants uh, in the first at the New York World's Fair in 1939. Then during the war, it reopened uh, in 1945. And every French restaurant in New York looked like it had the red banquettes, it had the pink or rose colored roses. Um, and very, very haughty, because they look forward to be to those people whom they did not know or pay uh, obeyance to, like these gorgeous swans who came in, and like Bill Paley, who owned CBS, or uh, Henry Luce, who owned Time Life. These people got the best tables, and the rest of us were shunted off to Siberia. Well, I wasn't around back then. I was on a, uh, <laughs> on a beer and pizza diet back uh, then. But later on, when I got to go to Le Côte Basque in the 1970s, these women were largely dissipating the scene because uh, America had gotten much more food conscious. So that the French restaurants starting in the 1970s, including Le Côte Basque, which was sold to a chef, uh, became much, much better restaurants and typified nouvelle cuisine, wed to tradition. So you could eat at Le Côte Basque and at Le Cirque and at um, Lutece and at several others. So there are, there are probably about 15 of them. You could eat as well in New York on that kind of cuisine as you could in Paris at that time. Maybe they didn't have quite the ingredients they had in France, but that came across uh, um, uh, also in very short order. Better wines than ever before, better ingredients like foie gras, which you couldn't get. As a matter of fact, Henri Soule, who owned Le Pavillon, once said that <clears throat> the merest bourgeois housewife in the countryside of France can get better fraise de bois, wild strawberries, than I could if I pay any amount of money here in New York. They just can't get them, you know. Um, that said, by the 1980s, things had shifted. That cuisine matters. There was new American cuisine. And this is when uh, celebrities, who had always packed restaurants out there in Los Angeles, certainly, um, You'd hardly go into a place uh, in uh, Los Angeles without bouncing into the celebrities at the time who went to place, places like Gene and Giorgetti and went to places like um, uh, the uh, Brown Derby and so forth. Um, Mr. Chow's Beverly Hills became a residence uh, for many of these people. So and that was always being talked about. But those people were also coming to New York. Some of them were putting money into restaurants which almost inevitably failed after a year of celebrity. There was one called, operated by three or four models of the time, the supermodels of the time, Linda Evangelista and, and uh, others who um, didn't put in a penny of their money, but you went there expecting to see uh, Cindy Crawford and, and Linda Evangelista and uh, Claudia Schiffer because they were the owners, um, which was silly. Sinatra used to define who got the best tables in New York. And uh, uh, they tell a funny story about the colony. The colony was superseded um, the swans by having people like Cary Grant and, and, uh, and Frank Sinatra show up. So one time the maitre d' was newly appointed, his name was Sirio Maccioni. Uh, his first day on the job, he gets a call from um, Cary Grant's people says, we'd like a 1230 table. And uh, he looked and he says, oh, yeah, he always likes to sit at table four. <clears throat> so the next call was from um, uh, Aristotle Onassis, who said, I want my usual table. And that was table four. <laughs> and then Sinatra calls <laughs> his people and says, he'll be over at 130. He's going to be there with Mia. Pharaoh, and he wants his table, which is table four. So how do you handle that? Well, as it turns out, um, 
when uh, Cary Grant showed up, he says, uh, would you mind saying, no, no, that's quite all right, quite all right. On, even though NASA says, I don't care, I make the table, the table doesn't make me. But Sinatra <laughs> refused to budge. He was going to get that freaking table. You know? So they used to have a lot more sway than they, they, they do today. Because, But now we have a lot more celebrities, and you can be sure that if Taylor Swift showed up at restaurant A tonight, and you think, I want to go to restaurant A because she's there. She never goes to the same restaurant twice. Neither did John Gotti, by the way. John Gotti, the gangster. <laughs> never. For different reasons. Yeah, for different reasons. <laughs> he didn't want to think he was going to be there Tuesdays or Thursdays, Thursday <laughs> nights. So um, was Le Code Basque an excellent restaurant at the beginning? Probably, yes. I didn't get to, to eat there. It became better and better. It was one of the top New York French restaurants. And a uh, few of them are still around. La, La Granouille, um, which is still around, um, is probably the closest because it's the most traditional and classical. And it still gets a clientele of uh, rich people who couldn't care less what they're eating as long as they can eat there and uh, not keel over into their uh, asparagus and soup. <laughs> well, times have changed, certainly. Um... But I think there's always a certain element of, of uh, the crowd, of the audience that wants to see yes. a celebrity, which is why um, celebrities open up their own restaurants, is it not? Well, there's not much money to be made. They usually get some kind of fee. And if any profits come to them, so they pay Arnold Schwarzenegger or whomever to open a restaurant and he's he's seeing a, a fee plus uh, uh, when Michael Jordan had steakhouses he didn't put any money into those things um, you don't have to when you're when you're a star because they just want your name on the on sure. the door somewhere yeah I think uh, Travis Kelsey is uh, with uh, Mahomes is now opening up a steakhouse in uh, Kansas City yeah yeah no. and uh, who, who was the um, Great, uh, was it the Miami Dolphins coach Don Shula? Shula, a, sure. Shula, there's a bunch of Shula steakhouses, and uh, yeah. others didn't work. Or M Mickey Mantle had a steakhouse in New York, and uh, thinking he probably, oh, yeah. probably he probably teamed up with Whitey Ford. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. doubt it. Yeah. Well, anyway, so the bottom, stay the same. bottom line was that these were not terrible places to eat. These were no. you got a quality meal. Uh, whether it be the Swans or whether it be that earlier group that you're talking about, celebrities don't go to a dive in general. Well, the curious thing is that now, because of Gordon Ramsay and Giada De Laurentiis and Emeril Lagasse, who have their name on multiple restaurants, they yeah. have become stars. So the chefs have become the stars, and that's why people want to go with Guy Fieri restaurant and eat that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, John, anyway, thanks so much. Yeah, this this is a, 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 a you just know so much about the food and food scene and the restaurants that it's always wonderful to hear these stories. Now I'm going to go back. I think uh, uh, previous to going on air, uh, I was telling you that I was uh, I I'd seen the last episode of Swans. I had missed the first couple and I was disappointed because I couldn't follow the story as well. And I'm going to go back uh, to the beginning and I'm also going to look at the food. So thank you very much. Uh, the food was, uh, as you see, very short glimpses, but of course they had to go out and hire a great chef to make them. Because, see, whenever you show food on camera, whether it's um, uh, Downton Abbey and they're sitting at this grand table, that mm. takes all day to shoot. So if you put out a creme caramel, yeah. that thing is going to be soup <laughs> under those hot lights within 10 minutes. So mm, yeah. there's a lot of preparation and what to do. And um, they probably shoot the food first early in the uh, early in the day i would think great i can tell you also that they have to prepare if it's food that they actually have to sip or taste yeah they have to prepare it completely different than the than the big turkey or or whatever it is that sits in the middle of the table because nobody could eat that you know it's got <laughs> a lot of that stuff, stuff on it to make it look a lot good of that stuff is sprayed with with oil to make it glisten or glow or just yeah. hold it together. I don't know if they put on their K2R or yeah. something. <laughs> and that sounds like the, a great uh, uh, subject for another episode of Show Food. Yes. Yeah. John, Thank thanks you. again. Thank you. Pleasure. And I, I, before we go, I just want to remind everybody uh, to sign up for 
the virtual gourmet by going to johnmariani.com. Great article, uh, but there's also great articles about uh, uh, food restaurants all around the world. So really worth uh, becoming it's a subscriber. It's ridiculously free. <laughs> and, it's and, and you get glimpses of his uh, novels uh, <laughs> and uh, see all the books that you produced. And they're really terrific. I own a few myself and I always enjoy watching, uh, reading the episodes of your uh, mystery novels uh, yeah. of, as of late. So thank you very much. And it's all thank archived. So if if you if you start getting into it, you can go back years and catch yep. all sorts of interesting information. So again, John, yep. thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Eat well, guys. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.